So first of all, uh, thanks for this kind invitation for this uh, incredible uh, uh, symposium on structural biology. And uh, I must thank uh, Tuan, uh, Jerson, and Tiago for this kind invitation. And uh, so uh, I've changed the title a, a little bit to account for our uh, latest work, which uh, was published uh, just a few days ago. And uh, so uh, I work at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Mohali. And we are located at the foothills of the Himalayas. So I have taken a picture from uh, the terrace of our building. And I can see that uh, beautiful uh, lower Himalayas uh, surrounding our campus. And it's definitely a privilege to work at a, an institute uh, with such a gorgeous uh, view of the Himalayas. So, <clears throat> so first of all, I would uh, like to acknowledge my uh, highly talented and hardworking students uh, who have been uh, so my lab has been <clears throat> working on uh, intrinsically disordered proteins, uh, prions and amyloids for about uh, 13 years now. And many of the former members have uh, uh, joined um, institutes in the United States primarily and also in Europe. And one of my former students is now a faculty member as, uh, who did postdoc at the University of Michigan, Neha Jain and she is now a faculty member at the Indian Institute of Technology at Jodhpur in Rajasthan. <clears throat> and today I'm going to tell you uh, a work which has been uh, carried out by Aishwarya, uh, a final year graduate student who has already submitted her PhD thesis, uh, Sandeep and Anamika. <clears throat> and of course, um, there are others who have been making very uh, interesting discoveries uh, in our lab. And I'm also very thankful to uh, my institute and the funding agencies uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the gift of plasmids from Vito Suravits uh, for the prion plasmid, which I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about today. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this is, uh, this slide basically depicts the overarching premise of our uh, research. So we are interested in conformational excursion of intrinsically disordered proteins uh, by looking at uh, chain chain and chain solvent interactions and how these highly disordered structures uh, convert into highly ordered uh, nanostructures having a diverse exquisite uh, nanoscale morphologies uh, ranging from spherical oligomers to pore-like structures to different kinds of fibular architecture. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have been immensely interested in liquid-liquid phase separation of these uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. And we also try to ask questions how uh, these liquid condensates basically uh, allow the nucleation of amyloid conformers and so forth. So, so today I'm going to tell you a, a short story about uh, what we have been doing for the past year and a half. So, of course, uh, I don't need to, in, you know, uh, state this to this audience, but uh, just, you know, some introduction and uh, about uh, biomolecular condensation via liquid-liquid phase separation, which uh, yields uh, membraneless organelles and they carry out an array of critical cellular functions. At least they have been, a, 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 you know, uh, implicated in, uh, in uh, putative functions. And um, a majority of the, uh, uh, of the drivers of this liquid-liquid phase separation uh, involves multivalency in the protein or intrinsically disordered proteins and regions. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, in vitro, 
Uh, this uh, membraneless organelles can be recapitulated in the form of uh, uh, liquid demixing, where uh, you know a well-mixed uh, solution demixes into a two-phase system, having a, a protein-rich condensed phase and a dispersed phase having much lower protein concentration. Over the years, uh, we have uh, understood uh, the field, of course, uh, has been quite resurgent in the last uh, few years. And we know uh, that certain sequence features like uh, intrinsically disordered segments, low complexity domains, and, uh, and uh, also East prion-like domains, they basically are the primary driver of liquid-liquid phase separation which is uh, critically controlled by uh, a, a, a very intriguing thermodynamic balance, you know, entropic and enthalpic balance. Here you can see the entropic term, here the enthalpic term having the chi, floric chi parameter, which basically quantifies the uh, change in interaction mediated by a variety of non-covalent interactions such as uh, hydrophobic, hydrogen bonding, cation pi, pi pi interactions, and so forth. <clears throat> and of course, this enthalpic term is what basically uh, counteracts with the entropy of mixing term, uh, giving rise to a positive Helmholtz free energy of mixing Therefore, uh, a solution will spontaneously phase separate into uh, a two-phase system. Shown here is a typical phase diagram that I have just drawn, a schematic uh, of a phase diagram. And uh, <clears throat> intrinsically disordered proteins are essentially biological uh, associative polymers having uh, stickers and spacer architectures. And of course, the sticker residues uh, can promote uh, transient interactions, whereas the spacer uh, residues interspersed between the stickers can basically modulate uh, the making and breaking of these interactions, giving rise to the liquid-like, highly dynamic nature of these condensates. So <clears throat> in the last couple of years, we have uh, uh, carried out uh, uh, quite a, a, a few uh, experiments on a quite a few intrinsically disordered proteins. And we have also understood a bit uh, the role of the dynamism in, in, in liquid phase condensation and how chain expansion and, uh, and interaction and dynamics, uh, especially the backbone dynamics can control this liquid phase uh, condensation. And this uh, aspect is summarized in one of the invited feature articles that was published uh, last year. And we have also been able to show that in addition to hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions, you can also have intermolecular charge transfer, uh, you know, uh, interactions that can, that can promote such phase transitions. Uh, both liquid-liquid as well as liquid to solid to maturation. So <clears throat> today I'm going to tell you about a highly celebrated protein, the prion protein. And uh, of course, uh, we uh, are incredibly familiar with this, uh, you know, uh, exciting protein. And of course, it's not, it now appears in, uh, in, in textbooks. So what is normally, uh, you know, uh, stated is uh, that a uh, cellular prion protein having highly alpha helical uh, structure converts into a highly beta structure, which is described as creepy prion. And this particular structure can self replicate by binding induced conformational conversion of the native protein into the beta rich form, which gives rise to this amyloid like aggregates. And this kind of uh, conformational stimulation accounts for its infectivity or transmissibility that is seen in many prion diseases. 
So, of course, this misfolding is very important. Misfolding of the alpha helical part is highly important, and that can uh, happen due to a wide variety of reasons, including uh, destabilization, mutations, familial mutations, and so forth. But today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, N-terminal uh, disordered frag segment of the prion protein. And of course, what is shown over here is what you see in the structural studies. And it also has a fairly long intrinsically disordered domain or intrinsically disordered N-terminal domain. And I have shown here uh, a human PRP NMR structure, okay, which is from 90 to 231. So we can imagine the intrinsic disorder can even run uh, down to the, the down to the first residue of this protein, 23rd residue, which is the matured form of the protein. And therefore, I have actually, and if you overlay the NMR structure, which I have done here, show that that the conformational heterogeneity uh, is present around the protein because uh, of this intrinsically disordered end terminal domain. So now uh, one might want to ask the question, what's the role of this intrinsically disordered domain uh, in the protein misfolding or aggregation or in function? Of course, we know that most of the putative peon functions are localized in the intrinsically disordered domain. So if we uh, zoom into the sequence, of course, we can see that uh, you know, uh, this is basically the in intrinsically disordered domain having oligopeptide repeat regions. Uh, and, and of course, the structured C-terminal global domain and an intriguing uh, amber stop codon mutation, which basically truncates the protein halfway through, okay, at Y uh, tyrosine uh, stop here. And that basically results in the formation of an intrinsically disordered protein because the C-terminal part is now not translated because of the stop codon mutation. So typically, a prion protein is a GPI-anchored protein. So the GPI anchor is uh, at the C-terminal end. And if there is a mutation, Y145 stop, of course, first you uh, don't uh, translate the globular domain, so it's an intrinsic yeah. protein. And secondly, uh, the GPI anchor is also not translated. Therefore, this becomes an intracellular protein, which accumulates in cytoplasm. So, so basically, uh, I have basically extend the intrinsic disorder down to uh, the end terminal. Uh, uh, you know, you know. A starting point, which is the 23rd residue. And this is analogous to a cleavage. Of course, you are stopping this and it, it basically yields an intrinsically disordered domain. Uh, and under stress condition, this particular fragment accumulates in the ER, Golgi, and the nucleus. And it is of interest to note that Y145 stop contains a cryptic nuclear localization, which uh, was often masked in the full length prion protein. So it can go to the nucleus, which has been shown previously. And uh, this can also result in pathological amyloid deposits in the brain, giving rise to this unique GSS phenotype. So we have been quite interested in this particular, uh, you know, fragment of this protein. We created uh, by using a mutation on the full length uh, plasmid. And then, of course, we uh, did some bioinformatics. And of course, Ponder tells you that the N-terminal domain is highly disordered. And the program, which was uh, developed by Monica Fuchsreiter's lab, a fast drop, fast spread program, which basically makes prediction about phase separation. And you can see that the N-terminal part of the prion protein is highly prone to phase separation. Whereas, of course, the C-terminal domain is a bolded domain, so it doesn't have a chance to make multivalent interactions, okay? 
So when we express the protein, uh, purify the protein, and here I show the circular dichroism spectra of the uh, Y145 stop fragment uh, against the full length prion protein. And of course, in full length prion protein, you can see a typical alpha helical fold. And here you see highly disordered structure. Now, if you look at the sequence and the, uh, you know, of this particular fragment from 23 to 144, there are a large number of positively charged residues, okay, uh, especially in the repeats. And of course, there are, uh, you know, aromatics like uh, a large number of tryptophans, okay, and also a short stretch of hydrophobic uh, segment without any uh, charged uh, residues. So because, of, because this is highly charged fragment, so when, you, uh, when we add, increase the ionic strength, we basically observed uh, a, a phase separation from a transparent mixed uh, phase into a demixed uh, turbid solution by increasing the ionic strength of the solution. And uh, under microscope, we can see this beautiful uh, spherical liquid droplets under, uh, you know, pretty much physiological condition, uh, uh, physiological pH at 37, but at a little bit higher salt concentration, okay? And uh, these droplets, of course, uh, possess uh, all the liquid-like behavior, like fusion, surface wetting properties, dripping, and so on. And uh, if we, uh, you know, frap this, there is a fast recovery uh, after photo bleaching, uh, which also which also tells us that the internal architecture is highly mobile, highly dynamic. And we can also estimate the diffusion coefficient, which basically matches quite well with the, the liquid-like interior of this condensates. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another question we ask, if we have the full-length prion protein, and of course, bioinformatic search, uh, bioinformatic uh, analysis, CAT granule uh, program showed that the full-length prion protein has a much lower phase separation propensity as opposed to the 145 stop fragment. And that's exactly what we see by turbidity measurements uh, that the full length uh, prion protein, it does phase separate, of course, as you can see in the confocal image as well. But Y145 stop has a much higher propensity to form liquid droplets. Whereas just the C-terminal part, which is from 112 to 231, did not show any uh, turbidity or we were not able to see any droplets in confocal uh, micrograms. So, so basically uh, these results, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, indicated that the, the N-terminal part is basically the major driver of phase separation of this protein. And therefore this amber stop codon mutant basically uh, phase separates into highly dynamic liquid droplets. Now, we wanted to uh, sort of, uh, we asked ourselves, can we uh, learn more about the uh, <clears throat> inscrutable workings of this droplets by zooming into these droplets and doing spectroscopy uh, that allows us to access the wealth of uh, information? Of course, fluorescence is great. You see, uh, you know, uh, the dynamic behavior, uh, you visualize the droplets, but of course we can't get, uh, you know, uh, very high resolution structural information. Therefore, we basically try to next do vibrational Raman spectroscopy, which uh, we are uh, quite well set up with in our lab. And I'll just show you uh, the setup that we have basically, we have a, a near infrared laser and that is passed through a couple of filters and through an objective, we can precisely focus into a single droplet. So we have the capability of uh, acquiring uh, vibrational Raman uh, spectroscopic information from a single uh, droplet, so which is incredible. And the scattering, of course, is passed through, uh, again, some filters and diffraction grating and dispersed onto 
uh, a CCD camera that allows us to sort of disperse the spectrum, okay? So this uh, single droplet Raman is quite, quite nice. And of course, here I have uh, shown uh, an image uh, and you can see a droplet, uh, the crosshair of, of the microscope, okay? So we can easily focus into a single droplet and we can learn about uh, various vibrational signatures present in the polypeptide chain. Uh, of course, of interest uh, uh, is uh, amide, carbonyl, and, and of course the other side chain vibrations. And, and interesting thing about Raman spectroscopy is uh, you, can, you can look at a wide range of, wide range of uh, bonds uh, present in the proteins from amide, from side chains, and all kinds of other, uh, you know, uh, functional groups uh, in the amino, uh, different amino acids. So I'll show you here uh, dispersed phase and droplet phase Raman. This is, of course, bulk Raman. And then we can also do single droplet Raman. All the vibrational features can be beautifully recapitulated into a single droplet uh, Raman measurements because we are now focusing the laser beam into a condensed phase and we get a very high signal to noise ratio. Uh, and uh, there are various interesting uh, signatures. Uh, of course, one of the uh, important signature is amide one band, which is due to the carbonyl stretching uh, of the polypeptide backbone. And that is also a marker of secondary structure. And when we see from dispersed to droplet phase, there is a, a broadening of the, uh, of the amide one, which tells us that the heterogeneity in the condensed phase is much wider compared to the monomeric uh, uh, monomeric dispersed phase, which tells you that, you know, much more, uh, you know, dynamics and expanded structures can now participate in an array of intermolecular interactions uh, and, and, uh, and, and maintain its liquid condense-like state. And all, there are other signatures, of course, I'm not interpreting all uh, the peaks here, one of the interesting signatures here is a Fermi doublet coming from tyrosine. That is an interesting marker of the solvent accessibility. And we were able to show that uh, there is enough water penetration into the droplet. So it's a very highly labile uh, condensed phase inside the droplet. And uh, <clears throat> then of course, we wanted to study the, uh, the molecular drivers of uh, a phase separation of one uh, 45 stop fragment. And as we increase the salt concentration, we see more and more condensates. And this is due to the fact that uh, higher salt concentration uh, basically screens the polypeptide charges, right? And then uh, that allows the polypeptides to come together and interact with via uh, different uh, non-covalent interactions like hydrophobics and cation pi and so on. Uh, and uh, so electrostatic screening uh, seems to be very critical uh, for this uh, fragment. And of course, that's also indicated by uh, the pH responsive uh, phase separation as well, because if you go down to pH where the positive charge increases, then of course, we don't see any phase separation. And uh, hydrophobic interactions seem to be important because uh, uh, hexane diol, which is, a, uh, which is basically uh, uh, weakens the weak hydrophobic effects. And if you increase the concentration of hexane diol, we, uh, the, the uh, phase separation uh, ability is abolished. So, so, so you can, as, as I already mentioned, there is a short hydrophobic stretch in this particular uh, fragment. And we believe that this particular region is also participating in hydrophobic, weak hydrophobic interactions, uh, which form this condensate. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so in order to test that, we also <clears throat> uh, basically uh, uh, made these mutations, the alanine to glycine to make it less hydrophobic and alanine to valine to make it more hydrophobic. And, uh, and we showed that, you know, if you make it more hydrophobic, 
uh, the FRAP recovery becomes much slower, which means they undergo liquid to more gel-like states, which uh, sort of indicated that uh, hydrophobic effect is a key regulator of phase separation. <clears throat> In contrast to uh, canonical expectation, uh, we, show, uh, we saw uh, the, uh, at higher temperature, phase separation is abolished because if there is hydrophobic effect is a major effect, of course, uh, we expected uh, higher phase separation at a uh, higher uh, temperature because of the entropic effect. So we believe that in addition to hydrophobic effect, there are other enthalpic, uh, enthalpically driven interactions like uh, you know, electrostatic screening, for instance, hydrogen bonding, and maybe cation phi, because there are many lysines and, and a few arginines that can interact with tyrosines and tryptophan. There are a large number of tryptophans. Therefore, we put in arginine, and if we increase the concentration of arginine, we see phase separation propensity gets lower because arginine now can form, uh, inter uh, interact with, uh, with uh, you know, the aromatics and therefore it prevents, uh, you know, intermolecular interactions. And as I said, uh, uh, this particular fragment has, R is a polybasic fragment, so it binds to RNAs. And uh, in the presence of RNA, we can basically have uh, saturation concentration of phase separation down from 100 micromolar to 5 micromolar, so it can phase separate at a much lower concentration and at a much lower salt concentration like physiological salt concentration. And we were also able to show that RNA can sort of modulate the, the material property inside the droplets. Uh, it, it converts into more gel-like interior rather than the liquid-like interior uh, obtained without RNA. And RNA sort of buffers the phase behavior like it was uh, demonstrated before for FUS and FUS-like proteins. So at low concentration, uh, RNA basically promotes phase separation, whereas at high concentration, RNA dissolves these droplets into more homogeneous phase. So if we uh, allow these condensers to age, we see this beautiful morphology, sea urchin-like morphologies, uh, indicating uh, fibrous growth from these condensers. And if we perform uh, FRAP experiments, of course, uh, beyond a certain time, we don't see any FRAP recovery, uh, indicating these are now solid-like aggregates. And Raman spectroscopy and if, of course, if we do atomic force microscopy, we can see typical amyloid-like fibrils. And Raman spectroscopy also showed a much sharper amide one band, which is due to a cross beta structure. So therefore there is a conversion from disordered uh, condensates to uh, highly structured amyloid fibrils. And these amyloid fibrils uh, exhibit autocatalytic behavior. So if you take this amyloid fibril, seed them in the beginning of the reaction, they can bypass the lag phase. So they have the self-templating behavior like a bona fide prion amyloid uh, like, like conversion. So, <clears throat> so to summarize that, we think that uh, there are two uh, alternate pathways uh, for prion conversion. One, of course, is the uh, canonical protein misfolding pathway by which there is a misfolding event and then aggregation and giving rise to this, uh, you know, fibrils or fibrillar architecture. And the alternate pathway could be liquid-liquid uh, phase separation and this phase separation can now, uh, you know, these liquid droplets can undergo liquid to solid phase transition to form this amyloid fibrils. So, uh, so uh, one interesting uh, uh, observation is uh, if we have the, uh, you know, C-terminal folded uh, domain, uh, in other words, if we take the full length prion, of course, the phase separation propensity is much lower and these droplets also do not convert into archetypal amyloid fibrils. Therefore, uh, this possibly hints at a, you know, uh, some kind of protective role of this, uh, 
you know, folded domain, which is preventing uh, phase separation of the intrinsically disordered domain and transition into amyloid. But of course, the canonical misfolding pathway involves the destabilization of the folded domain. So that's a very, uh, that, that's fundamentally a different mechanism than uh, LLPS, at least that's what we think. So <clears throat> to summarize again, uh, uh, so uh, basically, uh, N-terminal idea is the functional domain, at least most of the putative functions like copper homeostasis, synaptic plasticity, uh, suppressing uh, apoptosis, resistance to oxidative stress, they're all concentrated in the intrinsically disordered uh, domain or the repeat domain, which is the copper binding domain. On the C-terminal domain, uh, we ask this question whether this can be a, a chaperone-like uh, domain, which is preventing the N-terminal domain from phase separating and performing its function, which of course we don't know the exact function, but maybe this part is important. And of course there is GPI anchor, which is tagged at the end of the C-terminal domain, which basically places the protein, uh, the uh, cell surface. So, <clears throat> so we think, uh, this might actually be uh, uh, a, a somewhat you know, testable hypothesis. And uh, C-terminal folded uh, domain is highly conserved during uh, the vertebrate evolution. Um, so there might be a protective uh, role of the C-terminal domain. So, <clears throat> so why 145 stop on the contrary having no uh, C-terminal domain spontaneously can attend the amyloid state via the non-canonical phase transition pathway. So I'd like to stop here because I think I'm running out of time. And I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you.